Good morning. Hi, I'm Senator Liz Krueger. Welcome to everyone. This morning's Boomer Senior Roundtable session is called the M, excuse me, the four M's, a framework for an age-friendly healthcare system. Um, today, I'm very excited with the really excellent panel of people we have uh, presenting. I, unfortunately, after doing the introductions, will have to sneak out of my own webinar um, because we're up in Albany and I have to deal with budget issues. So I want to welcome all the participants who are viewing on Zoom and or Facebook or might be calling in to this now second session of my 2022 Boomer Senior Roundtable Series, Aging in Place, Living Well in the Community. The seven part series will focus on some of the issues we need to address to age in place well. Future roundtables will focus on being solo in aging, technology, and making your apartment age friendly. I hope you can join us again for one or more of the future roundtables as well. As always, we have closed captioning available in today's event. And as a viewer, you can activate closed captioning on your computer or tablet, depending on which system you're in. In Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls and start viewing closed captioning. If you're on Facebook Live, you'll see a setting button in the bottom right-hand corner of your video screen. Click closed caption CC to start viewing closed captioning. This forum is being recorded and everyone who RSVP'd will receive an email of the link within a few days. The, the recording will also be available for watching through my website. Just one COVID update today. As you may have heard, the Biden administration announced that at-home rapid tests can be ordered at no charge as of January 19th. Individuals may place an order for a total of four at-home rapid tests per household online. The website address has been posted in the chat. There are no shipping costs and you are not asked to provide a credit card numbers. Individuals will be asked to provide their name, residential mailing address, and an email address if they want to receive order status updates. At-home tests are estimated to arrive in seven to 12 days after placing an order. Please note there have been some glitches with the Postal Service website when multiple households in the same house building have placed orders. This issue is in the process of being resolved. If you receive a message that tests have already been ordered for your address, try putting your complete address, including your apartment number, in the street address PO box field. And of course, for those of us here in New York City, there are also a variety of ways that government is involved, uh, state and local government, in helping distribute free tests. And of course, ins most insurance now has to cover the costs of the test if you find yourself needing to go purchase some, because we want to make sure that you can get tested and can get the answers that you need. And now we're gonna move on to today's discussion, the four M's, a framework for an age-friendly healthcare system. Our roundtable last Thursday evening focused on good primary care as we age, and how to work best with your doctor. This morning, our presenters will broaden the focus by providing information about a framework to develop a patient-centered health system designed to meet the needs of older adults. The four M's of good health care are what matters to you, mobility, mentation, cognitive and mental health well-being, medications to support your health goals. Today we have with us. Rainy Schneider, Vice President for Program at the John Hartford Foundation, and Jane Carmody, a Senior Program Officer at the Foundation, who will share information about the concept of the 4M framework. We will also hear from Dr. Maria Carney, Chief of the Division of Geriatric and Palliative Care Medicine at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, who is also involved with the Foundation's age-friendly emergency room pilot program initiative. Finally, we will, we will also have some additional people um, coming in to help with answering questions at the Q&A later. Just to remind you, 
Many people have already submitted questions, but you can still submit questions during the course of the webinar by typing into the QA function on your Zoom or Facebook screen. So we're at the beginning of the state budget season, as I described. So I now have to move on to my next Zoom. But after the presentation, Brad Usher, my chief of staff, will moderate the Q&A portion of the event. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Ronnie Schneider and Jane Carmody. Good morning, ladies. Okay, we need, oh good. Good morning. And thank you so much for having us. Great. I'm gonna pass it to you. Fantastic. Now we have some slides to share. So I will hold for one moment. Fantastic. Uh, I do wanna say thank you so much um, to Senator Kruger and to Brad Usher and the rest of the staff. Uh, we're really pleased to be here and talk to you a little bit about the work that we do at the Johnny Hartford Foundation. So as um, Senator Kruger mentioned, I am Ronnie Snyder. I'll start and then I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Jane Carmody, um, to do the, the next piece before she hands it over to Maria, uh, Dr. Carney at, at Northwell. So um, I'm going to move to the next. Let's see. Let's go straight to slide four, if you will. And then we, um, I, I mentioned, you know, I want to thank you for being here. So let's go to the next slide. And I'll tell you just a little bit about the John A. Hartford Foundation. So we are a private philanthropy. We're based in the city. Um, we're established by the family owners of what you may know as the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, otherwise known as A&P Grocery. Um, and we've spent more than a half a billion dollars at this point in grants since the launch of our aging and health program in 1982 to improve the care of older adults. We really operate at the intersection of um, aging and the healthcare system. So um, next slide, please. I do wanna say that while we um, operate, we live and operate in New York, um, the work that we do is national. So the talk that I'm going to um, share with you today is really gonna be um, introducing some of the work that we do nationally and then doing a little bit of a deep dive in various places of how that work is playing out in New York. So as I mentioned, our mission is dedicated to improving the care of older adults. And we do that through these three program priority areas. We'll be talking the most today about building age-friendly health systems. In addition, uh, we have an area around supporting family caregivers and another around improving serious illness and end of life work. You can see from this image that these are um, not siloed areas. These are very much overlapping. And as I sometimes say, for example, you can't have an age-friendly health system if you're not supporting family caregivers. Similarly, you, you can't have a, an age-friendly health system if you're not really working hard to improve serious illness and end of life care. So next slide, please. I do wanna say we think of the work that we do as a catalyst for change and that we also view collaboration as a really key piece of the work that we do. So again, we're really happy that you're here um, to listen and, and ask good questions at the end. So why do we need age-friendly solutions? So we're looking at the future, right? So starting with the demography, the growing number of older adults, followed by um, the complexity of care. For many older people, there are multiple chronic conditions. We see increasing numbers of dementia. Um, as we age, we are more likely to have disabilities and other functional limitations. And some of us have had them for many, many years. And last but definitely not least, when you think about the healthcare system, is the possibility of disproportionate harm. So uh, for many older adults, uh, they'll have higher rates of um, healthcare utilization, will have um, healthcare related harms, and there too often can be things like delays. We're seeing more and more of that with COVID, right? And discoordination. Next slide, please. So where does that bring us? It brings us at the Johnny Hartford Foundation to age-friendly solutions and the ways that we can address some of these concerns. I'm gonna talk in a minute about our thinking around eliminating ageism, 
Uh, but we also focus very much on healthcare, the communities that we, we all live in. And again, that's why we're here today. Um, and social services, which are so key and the other very critical part of what makes us healthy or not, as well as public health. So we'll touch on all of those a little bit this morning. Next slide, please. So I mentioned ageism. This is something that we think about across all of our work. There is ample evidence that shows that ageism has a true and a negative impact on our health. Uh, one in five adults uh, report experiencing ageism in healthcare, and it leads to both over and under treatment in different situations. And really, all of us have a role to play in redefining aging and the negative biases um, against getting older. You've all heard the comments, right? Um, so we want to start talking about aging as what it is, a natural lifelong process that unites us all, acknowledging the contributions of older people in our society and making sure that we're not talking about aging as a problem or something that needs to be fixed or a disease that needs to be cured. We are building momentum, the momentum that we all get as we age and that our society gets when we recognize, respect and call on that momentum to help all of us. Next slide, please. So another piece of being age friendly, which is, is broader, slightly different and a little bit broader perhaps than age friendly health systems is age friendly communities. Now this fits into a, the, the broader age friendly ecosystem that we see um, lots of opportunities for. Um, around 2006, the World Health Organization began its global network of age friendly cities. So our age-friendly health systems came after that and is very much um, a complement. So in 2012, AARP became the official U.S. affiliate spreading age-friendly cities and communities and states. Um, sometimes you may hear them referred to as livable communities. Next slide, please. So what about New York? Uh, AARP recognized New York as the first age-friendly state in 2017. And then... In 2018, the governor made a commitment to have 50% of our health systems become age-friendly. Therefore, moving towards age-friendly health systems. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about what that is in a minute. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm moving more specifically to healthcare. Um, so for older adults, we've seen the complexity that I mentioned previously, the possibility of disproportionate harm. And uh, we know that there are a lot of evidence-based practices and various geriatrics care models that, that exist, that have been proven effective for which we have evidence. Um, and yet they really only have reached a portion of the, of the numbers of people who could benefit in a whole variety of different places and settings. So they're difficult to disseminate and scale. They can be difficult to reproduce in settings that have less resources, for example. If something's created in a, in a resource-rich academic health center, it can be harder to put that in a community hospital, for example. Uh, and they don't always translate across different care settings. For example, something that works in a hospital might not work in a, a doctor's office or in a nursing home. So um, there are these complex care needs, chronic conditions, functional needs, and the possibility of advanced illness. Next slide, please. That brings us at the John A. Hartford Foundation to the age-friendly health systems. This is an initiative that really has been spearheaded by our president, Terry Fulmer, um, and was initiated together with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, very much in partnership with the American Hospital Association, the Catholic Health Association of the United States, and um, five key health systems all across the country. Next slide, please. I'll tell you a little bit more about what age-friendly health systems is. The age-friendly health systems framework, as Senator Kruger mentioned earlier, is based on these four M's. Now, we always put the um, what matters at the top. And that's because what matters to the individual and their family um, is so key to all of the other M's. These come together as a bundle and um, really is about the specific health outcomes and uh, goals and care of care preferences um, for that individual. 
The other three M's and they're, they're all again, interrelated include medications. So if a medication is necessary using age friendly medications, because not all medications are appropriate for older adults in all settings, um, that doesn't interfere with what matters again, back up to the top or with mobility or mentation across various settings of care. Second is mentation. Now that's anything cognitive. So um, that could be delirium, depression, um, dementia, and really, again, across all settings of care. And last but not least, mobility. So this is ensuring that older people get to move every single day in order to maintain function. And that function piece is so critically important because it brings us back up again to doing what matters. So next slide, please. So we initially called this a, a grant or an initiative. And I'll tell you what, right now, this is a movement. It has spread like wildfire. So um, originally our goal, as you can see here, was to spread it to 1,000 states, uh, excuse me, sites across the country by the end of 2020. And if you look at where we are now, now at these numbers that are on the slide are as of December, 2021. And uh, by that time we had reached almost 2,500 hospitals, practices, meaning doctor's offices um, or clinics, um, convenient care clinics that I'll tell you about in a minute, and nursing homes and pay sites all, all over the place um, that have joined this movement. And we've got, I think I heard a number this morning that was more than 30 different countries who are in some way participating in this. So we're very excited about the progress. Next slide, please. I mentioned convenient care clinics. So we do have an initiative uh, with CVS to um, partner with them and put age-friendly health systems work in every single CVS Minute Clinic. So um, there's 1,100 of them across the country. And those have included training and education for the nurse practitioners who are the primary uh, employees at those Minute Clinics and building the concept and, and the work behind the four M's into the electronic health record to make sure that it's being documented and acted on. Next slide, please. We're back to New York. I'm gonna keep coming back to New York. I mentioned earlier that in 2018, the governor's office um, made put out a directive that 50% of uh, New York health systems will be age-friendly in five years. That includes emergency departments. And I know you're gonna be hearing more about that from, uh, from Maria later. So I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Right now, the statewide effort is being led by the New York State Health Department. So the Healthcare Association of New York State is supporting the efforts. And there are 35 to 40 sites participating in the age-friendly health systems movement. That was funded not just by us, but also by four other New York-based funders, uh, other foundations who have committed to age-friendly health systems, to geriatrics emergency care, and to reframing aging. So um, similar to something I said a few minutes ago, you can't have age-friendly communities without age-friendly care. Next slide, please. We acknowledge the true importance of social services and supports, as I mentioned earlier, as part of what is health and healthy. Health starts in our homes, our schools, our workplaces, health starts in our neighborhoods and our communities uh, where all of you are. And it's also very much embedded in the nature of our interactions and our relationships. So you can see here 80 to 90% of health outcomes are driven by health related behaviors and other factors, environmental or, or socioeconomic. Um, and of course, COVID in the last, gosh, going on two years now, has exposed these persistent health and economic disparities that have put members of certain racial and ethnic minority populations at an even higher risk of infection, of severe illness, uh, and of death, really. So we wanna be very cognizant of that. Um, and then also um, community-based organization capacity is critical. Because of the, the interrelationships of these social determinants of health that go together with health, but are broader than just your health care, for sure, um, as well as educational and community-based programs, these are the ways, these community-based um, organization capacity, that are most likely to succeed in improving health 
So we have a whole host of initiatives underway at the John A. Hartford Foundation to bring together um, the community, social services, and supports world with the healthcare world. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about a couple of those. Next up, next slide, please. The other one I want to mention is public health. You know, um, public health is indeed responsible for these really dramatic increases that we've seen in longevity. But it's really interesting, although state and local health programs distribute things like, you know, the vaccine, the seasonal flu vaccine, and they offer certain programs for, for balance and exercise, let's say, or for di diabetes care um, or nutrition, and they may reach older adults, very few, virtually none, frankly, of the state public health departments have any kind of specialized division focused on the health of older adults. And doesn't that sound like something we ought to be paying attention to? So despite the, the growing demographics, public health departments are still much more likely to attend to maternal and child health um, and infectious diseases than they are to older adults and the chronic illnesses that are prevalent for older adults. This is something we're focused on. So next slide, please. Back to New York. So New York has been the first state to be recognized as an age-friendly public health system. This is an initiative that we work on with an organization called Trust for America's Health. And um, New York is one of the, the star states in this endeavor. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk about on-ramps to age-friendly health systems. Um, we see much of our work, again, as synergistic, as mutually reinforcing and as age friendly, even if it isn't specific and didn't start with those four M's. So for example, I'm using the geriatrics uh, ED work that you'll be hearing more about from Maria. Um, as an example here, um, the age friendly health systems movement and the movement to spread geriatrics emergency departments are deeply aligned. This is just one example. Um, they are indeed synergistic and mutually reinforcing. So we see, them as on ramps to one another to present really tremendous opportunities. So um, for example, by obtain for a, an emergency department, obtaining a geriatric emergency department accreditation, showing that they are indeed um, by certain standards, uh, geriatric friendly, they are forming the basis of 4Ms care. And similarly, we have age-friendly health systems uh, participants that started in, for example, primary care settings, not emergency departments, and then identified emergency departments as a place to go deeper in age-friendly care, um, sometimes with training from the geriatric uh, emergency department collaborative that we support, and other times through other venues. So the term we use to describe this is there is no wrong door. So right now there's work going on to develop crosswalks and case studies um, to see really tremendous outcomes that come with both initiatives and to see those come together. So next slide, please. This is a little bit of information about our geriatrics emergency care programs. So there are three different levels of uh, accreditation there um, through our accreditation program, through what's called the um, a society called the, emergency, uh, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and then a separate and parallel track um, which is a collaborative for those who work in the emergency department and want to bring together their work where they offer training, education, and research on the 4Ms in emergency departments. Um, and they offer all kinds of other opportunities for those who are interested in, in uh, emergency departments. Next slide, please. I'm just gonna give you a little sense of the numbers right here. There are 285 accredited emergency departments in the US. 66 more are in process across 41 states. So the fact that New York is focused on this is really exciting because we're gonna have a concentration here and that will be helpful to you and all of the people that you love in the New York area. Next slide. Speaking of New York, here's what's happening in New York state. Uh, there are 36 emergency department sites uh, accredited, including VAs, Veterans Administration Hospitals, uh, the Rochester Regional Hospital, Stony Brook, um, and Thompson. And so 
we're going to hear a little bit more, as I mentioned, from Northwell because Northwell is really cool and they've used a health systems approach. So not just one emergency department, but across various of their hospitals. Um, there are 16 additional New York emergency departments in process. And I'll skip some of these additional um, details, but uh, just to show you right here, because it's exciting and it's a little preview for Maria uh, for what she's gonna say, Northwell Health has got all of their emergency departments accredited. Next slide, please. Here's another complimentary program. Um, this is also, as I was saying, an on-ramp and also an important place to consider integration. So we have funded a geriatrics surgery verification program uh, across four different focus areas. There are, are standards that they must adhere to, there's 32 standards to be exact, um, and three different levels of care, much like the emergency department work that we have done and there are 52 sites in, in process. Again, New York has the first hospital in the US to be verified. Now this is up in the Rochester area, Unity Hospital, which is a Ro uh, Rochester Regional Health Hospital. Next slide, please. There are other age-friendly on-ramps, if you will, and these are just a couple of them. So um, there is a program called Hospital at Home, that uh, it really has been led by the, the um, hospital at Mount Sinai. Uh, there's currently a waiver by the federal government, CMS is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, to allow additional hospitals during COVID to do this hospital at home program for people who qualify so that um, instead of going to the hospital, they can get truly hospital level ser services at home for certain, uh, certain health needs. And um, there are five of those are in New York State at this point. In addition, we fund an Alzheimer's and dementia care program. This came out of UCLA. Um, and there are 20 different locations currently nationally that are ramping this up. And again, look at Northwell Health, as well as the University of Rochester. So uh, we're about to support a, a new phase of this work with 50 additional sites. So. Stand by, there will be more we, we presume in New York too because the New Yorkers are such leaders. Next slide, please. As a first step towards building a, a comprehensive roadmap for meeting the needs of aging New Yorkers, the governor announced, gosh, two weeks ago, her plans to issue an executive order to implement a state, a state master plan for aging. The only state that has accomplished this so far is California. New York will look very different, uh, but all, this is very exciting for us uh, because it brings together all of these pieces of work. Um, the, the master plan ultimately will coordinate um, state policy and programs, will create a blueprint of strategies to ensure that New Yorkers can live the fulfilling lives uh, with the best health, with the freedom and independence to age in place for as long as possible. So we're very excited um, about this and working with other funders in New York across the state uh, in terms of moving the master plan on aging forward. So this is my, ne next slide please. This is my last slide before I hand it over to Jane to talk a little bit more about what matters. You know, um, we really see age-friendly solutions as being solutions for everyone. So um, cities and, and, and states, there are stories about the ways that doing the right thing for older adults really is doing the right thing for everyone. And I'll give you one short story, which is that um, they created curb cuts for people with disabilities. Um, but ultimately, curb cuts, as you know, so that it's so that there isn't a step up onto the curb. Um, ultimately, those are helpful to all of us. They they help parents with children. They help people with walkers. They help um, all of us to live a better and easier uh, and uh, life, and therefore to affect um, our mo mobility. Uh, and ultimately what matters to us. So that's one small example. There are other examples shown here. You can see to the, to the right, that's um, Sarasota beaches use this, um, they call it a Moby mat for older people to be able to get up and down to the beach. But look at that, it really helps everyone. So this is for, for all of us and for our community. And with that, I'm going to stop. 
I'm going to turn it over to Jane Carmody, who's going to do a great job sharing with you a little bit about what matters most. Thank you so much, Ronnie. Um, and I'll add my appreciation for the opportunity to be here today and to talk about our favorite topic, which is improving care for and healthier lives for all of us as we age. Now, it sounds like last week, um, uh, the, uh, Senator Kruger had a talk with uh, how to uh, talk with your or uh, have a, a better primary care. So I hope this fits right in with that. And I think it'd be fun to talk about what matters most and figure that out for all of us. So next slide, please. I, well, you have my slide. Yeah, now go to the next one. I should have said that, Jason. So. Um, um, I will take a few minutes to talk a little bit more about what matters and how to figure out what that is and how to better discuss what is important with your own healthcare providers and your own physicians. Age-Friendly uh, Health is an initiative, as Ronnie talked about, building, uh, focusing on building health systems that provide high quality healthcare to older adults. And in an age-friendly health system, they take patients' needs and preferences into account in every aspect of care. And that's what we're working towards. In 2013, the foundation started a partnership and still goes on today with a well-known geriatrician, you know, those are doctors who focus on older people, to figure out how to improve care for older uh, people to move from treating diagnoses to caring for priorities for whole person care. So treating diagnosis and caring for priorities priorities for whole person care. This team figured out a better way and a new process and they termed it patient priorities care to address what matters most as Ronnie's talked about. There are two links here. The first one is a full website and that's really to help train um, doctors and nurses and health professionals on how to elicit uh, what matters and then how to embed that in the care plan. And second is my health priorities so that we can all determine what matters most to us and share that with our health care team um, on the care that's being planned. So when you go to the doctor's office and maybe you talked about that last, last week. Okay, next slide, please. So what is patient priorities care? It really moves uh, from, well, you need meds for your high blood pressure or you need blood thinners for your atrial fib to knowing your health conditions, your overall health and what matters to you most, I suggest we try. And patients who in, were interviewed who had this experience from this shift in care with their doctors, they felt heard and they felt valued. In fact, they said they were blown away with this caring approach and taking into consideration all that mattered and they had better results. Next slide, please. And what they found in their studies that a person could be prepared for their office visit and think about their questions and preferences and what matters and maybe the one thing that is important and it makes the office visit go well and the doctor knows exactly, the doctors or the providers know exactly what you need. In this work to improve care, it found that we really don't think about what matters most. If someone were just to ask you right away what it was, it, you might have a little bit of a hard time thinking about it and being clear about it. So goals and preferences are, um, we have to think about it to be clear. So in the beginning, they ask people about things they like to do. What does a good day like? What is fun? And pretty soon your values and things that are important to you start coming up, such as your family and friends, your faith, fun, fun things that you like to do. And from there, we can think about the one thing we want to happen with, with this care at the next office visit. So patient priorities care is for all of us, but especially designed, as Ronnie noted, as we get older, for people that have more health conditions. So it is important to their overall care and keep all of the specialists and all the medications and every, um, every health provider that you encounter on the same page as to what matters most. So for Mr. A, he wants to maybe play poker and babysit. So his care preferences are to avoid medications that make him tired. He doesn't go to the doctor's office all the time and he really doesn't want any more procedures. And his one thing that he wants to be is I want to be less tired so I can get to poker and babysit my grandson. And I think it's my medication. So he's figured this all out as he gets to the doctor's office. So next slide. What do we need to know and do? We need to know our health priorities. And what we need to do is to be an active partner in our healthcare decisions. Next slide, please. So what are your health, count, uh, health outcome goals? They should be specific and measurable. Um, you don't wanna just say, well, I wanna be more active. I wanna walk more. It really should be uh, things that we can think about, do, and then measure, and then move on. I wanna walk two blocks so I can babysit, or I wanna walk one mile three times a week with my walker, and then in three months, move to a cane, you know, et cetera. Then we can consider our, our next visit. We can, uh, we can bring these health priorities, what we want, and then take them to our doctor um, and our healthcare professionals. Next slide. 
So that link that I had in the beginning, um, the one for the, the full uh, website, and then this one is my health priorities, and I hope that you'll all try it. The link is available on your computer or your phone. If you don't have uh, a phone or computer that you can use, uh, maybe a friend or a family can print out the forms and you can do it on paper. But this health priorities uh, site takes you through each section. And what can kind of be annoying about it is that you have to answer something before you can move on. You can sign in and have a place to keep this information, or you can just sign in as a guest. And uh, you, if you want to try it for the first time or always be a guest, and if you keep it uh, logged in, then and then they can kind of keep a record. So next slide, please. It just goes through what matters, kind of helps you kind of articulate what is it that what matters to you. It'll go through, um, you know, what do you enjoy in life? You know, what function do you want to have? How are you managing your health and connecting with friends and families? Next slide, please. The site asks us to think about what does a good day look like? Who or what matters most in your daily life? What activities are most important and what activities would you like to do more of? And the next slide, please, we're almost there. Then comes the summary and you can print this out. You can think about it and go do it again if it didn't come out just exactly as you wanted. And then, uh, as, uh, and then do it uh, more often. You know, sometimes you have to do it, you know, every few months, maybe if, you're, if your health conditions change or what matters to you most changes, because um, we wanna make sure that this is accurate and I want you to print it out and take it to your doctor. I think, next slide, please. I think you'll enjoy doing this. It is also has some suggested questions and conversations, and maybe you heard about that last week with the, the talk about primary care uh, doctors. It helps all of us be more confident in what is important and to use the time in the office visit with our healthcare professionals uh, so that it, uh, we, don't you hate it when you walk out of the doctor's office and say, oh, I forgot to ask this, or I wish I'd do this, or I told him this medication is bothering me. So this one can really help you be organized. The team that developed patient priorities care is working to teach healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses about their part. So to listen and to take into account um, and to center on, on the person and their what matters most in providing age-friendly care. And with that, I am pleased to introduce my favorite New York geriatrician, Dr. Maria Carney, who is working hard to bring age-friendly care to Northwell and to the city. And so Dr. Maria, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Can everybody hear me all right? I hope <laughs> everybody's muted. Um, thank you. I want to thank Senator Kruger for having me um, to invited me to this to Ronnie Snyder and Jane Carmody. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful partnership. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Next slide. Great. Thank you so much. I I'm excited about being here because Northwell has embraced the age-friendly health system. Michael Dowling has embraced this, realizing the importance of this initiative. Um, I want to just say something. I am a geriatrician, palliative medicine, board certified, internist as well. I served as commissioner of health for Nassau County and I am the first geriatrician in New York State to have served in that role. And the reason I mentioned that is because, as Ronnie said, this is a movement. It's a cultural shift. It's a population health, public health necessary initiative. And we are taking it from a health system point of view to push to improve care for a growing population and hopefully a healthier, active, uh, empowered population. Next slide, please. So Michael Dowling, when we were recognized as an age-friendly health system, the press release went out. We had a, uh, um, a, a meeting with the media. It was virtual because of the times we are. But he, say, he stated, the right care at the right time. This is what age-friendly care is. It's patient-centered care, as was mentioned before. It's getting the right care at the right time. Next slide. And I just love that he said that. And, and I don't necessarily need to explain this, but the population is growing. New York State is home currently to the third largest older adult population in the nation. And is, the population over 65 is expected to grow to above 20% um, of the US population. We are an aging nation and New York and where I'm sitting now in Queens 
and Nassau County border, we're in an epicenter of this growing population. New York is embracing and needs to uh, continue this movement. Next slide. So I just wanna define some terms just so you understand where I'm coming from as a geriatrician and palliative medicine specialist. What is geriatric med medicine? It's the study of aging and aging is a multi-dimensional process with physical, psychological, and social change. We're on this journey from childhood, right? Infant, um, adolescence, adulthood, young adult, older adult. Geriatric medicine aims to improve and focus on health, independence, and quality of life. And it addresses not just chronological age, but functional age. So you could be a younger adult with some disabilities that have some geriatric issues. Um, or you could be a healthy older adult and you wanna maintain that independence. So it's both functional age and chronological age. It's multi and interdisciplinary care. We physicians, nurses, social workers, advanced care practitioners, community agencies to help us. And geriatric medicine specialists can work in a home environment, outpatient office, hospital setting, or in facilities. What is palliative medicine? Palliative medicine is for people with serious and complex illness. Perhaps you're facing a a cancer diagnosis, you may have some symptoms related while you're getting treatment. A palliative medicine physician can help you through that phase. It, palliative medicine collaborates with patients and families to clarify goals of the care during complex illness. A palliative physician specialist can be providing care at any age, any diagnosis, any stage in a serious illness. It can be provided with curative and life prolonging treatments. It too is multi and interdisciplinary care. And palliative medicine uh, can be provided at a home setting, outpatient office, hospital, or facilities. And as was stated in that Venn diagram that Ronnie had, you can't address aging without addressing serious and complex illness. And these two fields often overlap in many ways. So that's why we're a division of geriatrics and palliative medicine. We help patients wherever they are in their journey. Next slide. This is a term I want you to be aware of, advanced illness. And this is an arrow that describes somewhat of our health continuum we face in our journey. Advanced illness occurs when one or more conditions become serious enough that general health and functioning decline and treatments may begin to lose their impact. What does that mean? When treatments begin to lose their impact. You may be treated with a medicine for one illness and it's helping, but it may complicate another illness. And that becomes difficult. So where it's helping one thing, it may be hurting something else and some decisions need to be made. What's most important to you? If you wanna get pain medicine for something that's painful, but it makes you groggy, what's more important that you be awake, alert and interactive, but in pain, or you'd rather minimize the pain and be as somewhat groggy. So there are risks and benefits and decisions that need to be made. The health continuum is that as we go into our young adulthood, we may have an acute illness and it's treated. An infection, you get antibiotics. And as we get older, we may develop chronic illnesses, high blood pressure, osteoarthritis. Over time, we tend to accumulate these chronic illnesses. They're manageable, they're stable, but they may over time become progressive and more serious, and they may affect or limit our activities of daily living our ability to shop, our ability to clean our homes, our ability to make appointments. And that could be cognitive issues, physical issues. It could affect your ability to dress yourself, bathe yourself, and you need assistance. And then this is, tends to be when we face advanced illness, this advanced illness 
phase. And it's when we're in advanced illness, while we're treating the underlying illnesses, we wanna try to understand when someone might be hospice eligible so that we maximize their quality of life. So this is a continuum. Next slide. There's also aging physiology we have to be aware of. There's a normal aging physiology and the left graph shows that over time, as we age, the bottom axis, our organ function, you see the reserve capacity of our organs, whether that be our kidneys, our lungs, our nerve, our heart, tends to decline with age. And a simple example of that, if you look at marathon runners, New York uh, City Marathon, the times for the 20 year olds are, tend to be much different than those that are running at the age of 70. There's a natural decline that happens. And the red arrow I put in there is what we do in healthcare is trying to have preventive health issues to slow down that decline and healthy aging issues or initiative to slow down that decline, to maximize our organs, to keep our organs and our reserve as high as possible. So that, that decline maybe flattens. Another way to look at it is on the right graph, our chronological aging and our functional capacity. There is a decline with normal aging and these healthy aging efforts or preventive health efforts are trying to push that decline up so that we delay frailty and delay disability and maximize our independence. That's what we're trying to do with healthy aging. Next slide. This is just our mission for our division at Northwell. It's the division of geriatrics, palliative medicine across our health system. We want to provide reliable, high quality care to older adults and to all those with advanced illness. And we want to provide resources for patients and their loved ones. Next slide. Just briefly, this is Northwell Health. We are a health system, 15 hospitals in this area, but we're integrated. Next slide. We're not just hospitals. We're not just physicians in the community. We also have subacute rehabilitation, long-term care. We have laboratory services. We have home care called Northwell at Home. We have outpatient rehabilitation called STARS. Um, and we have hospice care. Next slide. So we're an integrated health system, which is unique. I wanna give two case examples. Uh, and then get into how we are implementing age-friendly health system. Next slide, please. This is our first case, longevity and healthy living how. And just briefly, this gentleman has been part of the Northwell Health System his whole adult life. He lived healthily. He had wife, two kids. Um, he had a very close relationship with his primary care physician. He worked, uh, was productive, was involved in his community. And again, he had strong social relationships and network. Um, after he retired, he continued help working in the community. He wrote books. He had a radio show. Um, he was interested in promoting healthy aging. Uh, because he felt he had the benefits of uh, a wonderful life. At the age of 89, he developed pain in his thigh and he was diagnosed with a sarcoma. Uh, his primary care referred him to oncologists and in oncology, he worked with our supportive oncologist doctor and spoke to him about what was most important to him. And for him, it was to live at home, in his home as independently as possible in the community and to continue his community efforts. Um, he, he was not interested in getting many uh, opiate pain medicines. So he was open to acupuncture and medical um, marijuana use to help prevent the use of opiate meds for his pain. He was able to participate in the chemotherapy 
uh, for years. He continued living in the community until one day he fell and broke his hip. He went to the hospital, was discharged to subacute rehab. And in subacute rehab, the conversation about what matters most continued. And it was always, I want to be home. I don't want to be in the hospital. I want to be with my family and my community. So those discussions led to him going home. He got care at home. We had a house calls program involved that he was involved. He was able to get care at home and he was transitioned to hospice care at the age of 94, six years after his original diagnosis of sarcoma. So that is an example of, next slide. So this is the health continuum example where he was living independently and then had a short course of being in an advanced ill state. And he had strong connection with his primary care, with the health system, and he had healthy aging. He discussed what matters most to him throughout his course. He described what was important to him medication-wise, and he avoided harmful medicines or minimized them. And he tried to maintain his mobility and independence for as long as possible and utilize rehab. So he had good transitions of care, and we achieved goal concordant care for him. Next slide. And case two is uh, Roberta, who utilized um, our emergency department. She's an 86 year old woman, lives in, a, in her own apartment and was walking in her apartment building and she fell and the superintendent called uh, an ambulance and she went to Long Island Jewish Medical Center where I um, am sitting on the campus of right now. In the emergency room, she was evaluated by the physician. She got the x-rays, blood work. Um, they were able to call her family member to understand her baseline. And as it was realized by the social worker in the emergency department that this was her third visit to the emergency department in three months. And that is when they implemented um, uh, connections to the community. This was, she was returning to the emergency department. She had falls and the family was distant. So they were referred to our office. They were referred to some community resources. The social worker uh, was able to call after she was discharged from the emergency room to make sure she was plugged into those appointments. She also had a home care visit to make sure her home was uh, safe and she was ambulating correctly. And um, next slide. So this is an example of how in the emergency department, the social worker, part of the geriatric ED identified a high risk case. It was good use of a multi and interdisciplinary care experience. The social worker and the ED physicians connected the, to specialty physicians and community resources. The social worker is using a platform that we are using in our hospitals called NowPow. It's a way you can put your zip code and some other details and it can, can identify community resources for patients. And this is how our social worker connected her to the resources in her zip code. And this was only possible because of the social worker in our Jerry ED. We had transitions of care to the home and she, in our office, where I'm sitting now. Um, she was evaluated. It was identified that she had some cognitive impairment. We were able to get the family together and identify that she needed more assistance at home. Um, they understood her illness better. And so this provided education to both the patient and family about the underlying disease uh, and other conditions that she was facing. Next slide. So the age-friendly health system here at Northwell. Next slide. You heard about the four Ms, the what matters most, mentation, medication, mobility, and I gave the case examples that Hope can try to exemplify how we're addressing this. But how are we implementing this and how, from a patient point of view or um, a person in the community, how will this potentially change what you see or experience. And I'm just gonna tell you how we are um, trying to implement this for the first M, what matters most. And 
as an example, and that we are doing the same thing for the other M's. Um, but hopefully this will give you an idea. Next slide. So we're doing this and we're embracing uh, the age-friendly health system, largely because it's a quality improvement effort. It's a movement, it's cultural, um, because we want to uh, not only improve and reduce admissions to our hospitals and improve the quality of care for patients and the experience, but it's also going to provide patient satisfaction and, um, and I think physician and clinician satisfaction as well. Next slide. And our goals for age-friendly care is to educate providers and clinicians and to standardize the use of evidence-based tools and processes for all of the four M's. We're going to be embedding um, aspects into the, your chart, into your electronic health record, so that it will become hopefully routinized to ask about what matters most, reviewing your medications, identifying your function, um, et cetera. We wanna improve outcomes. We're also creating dashboards. And what that means is so that we're monitoring our efforts. And that's important from a healthcare point of view because we measure everything. And we want this to be measured and we want our leadership to understand how this is impacting the care and the quality and our outcomes and, and, and also the patient experience. So we are using process improvement methodology in order to improve our metrics and our outcomes. And we have a goal to become an age-friendly organization across all levels of care, not just the hospitals, but also in the ambulatory environment and our other integrated health system worlds. Next slide. So what matters most? You, we heard a little bit about that. Next slide. How are we, what are we doing for this? So where we started, we've been on this effort of trying to improve care for those with advanced illness since 2014. And we realized we had to identify individuals who were facing advanced illness. And we started discussing about how do we have conversations with individuals to help them get goal concordant care and help us provide the right care, the patient-centered care that they want. So we created goals of care notes back in 2016. We then started realizing that we needed to help our clinicians have conversations with patients who had advanced illness. And um, it started really with our palliative care teams in the hospital that were doing this. And out of our specialists, we created a goals of care conversation education program. So we're teaching our staff, our physicians, our clinicians on how to hold goals of care conversations. Next slide. Um, actually, I'll just speak to the point is that, so we've routinized how to have, ask about what matters most. We've implemented it into our electronic health records. So these notes are in it. So when you potentially have a loved one or maybe hospitalized, people are going to ask you, what is most important to you? What, how can we get you home? How can we achieve what you want to achieve? Um, what is most important to you? So this will be part of it. We're then now moving on to the next M, mobility, and we have evidence-based tools for that. We have ways to implement it into our chart. We're trying to educate our clinicians with it. And it's a movement across the health system, partnering with our clinical transformation group in our health system to implement, embed, and change the culture. So we are just moving across the four M's. Next slide. So on the first case, we had, um, uh, a patient, Hal, who fell and broke his hip at the age of about 92. And um, we have embraced an initiative that has also been uh, supported by the John A. Hartford Foundation. It's the AGS Co-Care Ortho Program, American Geriatric Society Co-Care Ortho. And it's a multidisciplinary um, co-management program to help individuals who are over 65 who have had a hip fracture. It takes multidisciplinary care, um, has quality metrics and goals, um, embeds 
uh, the importance of uh, medications, mobility, what matters most into the four M's into this program and their protocols. We've rolled this out to four hospitals in our health system, and we are now looking to uh, share it throughout all 15. But it's been a wonderful quality improvement initiative for a population that needs multidisciplinary care and it embeds the four M's into um, this. Thank you. Next slide. What was mentioned is that uh, another initiative we have is a geriatric emergency departments. I have Dr. Teresa Amato here who uh, can speak, answer any questions specifically to it. She is the director of it. Um, what's wonderful is that we have all 17 hospitals um, in our region um, and even beyond our region, uh, that's why it's 17, are all certified in geriatric emergency department at um, level uh, three, the lowest level, the base level, and that is an enormous accomplishment. And then our one hospital, Glen Cove Hospital, has just recently gotten to the gold level, level one, and that has a separate area um, similar to some hospitals have pediatric emergency departments. Glencoe has a geriatric emergency department and there are metrics we're following. It embeds the four M's into it. And it's really been phenomenal. And we've been leaders at the nation working with the American College of Emergency Physicians to develop this. So we're very, very proud of this. Next slide. and it's all management pro, uh, program. We have a geriatrician, nurse practitioner, social worker um, to help patients with dementia and their caregivers. It's a dyad. It's a patient caregiver dyad where we support, follow, and help them as the, they deal with the um, journey of dementia. And we've been, this has been enormously successful for us. Next slide. Um, I just want to mention this because I just think this is a future and it's going to be part of our age friendly health system, not only linking to community resources, but educating patients and families about technology trends and resources available, whether it be in home electronic assistance to stay in touch with your loved ones, telehealth we're using and medical visits, in home cameras and motion detectors are just uh, becoming normal. GPS for patients with dementia who may be wandering so that we can safely find our, uh, those that may have wandered out of our site. Um, Amazon, you can order so many items in Amazon, um, but how do we work with your insurance to get that so that we minimize expenses? But yes, so much is available on places like Amazon. The NowPal platform I mentioned earlier is a community referral tool, which is changing how we provide care. Adaptive clothing to help caregivers who are involved in caring and dressing loved ones. And then other devices like alerts. Uh, Northwell On Call has a medical alert that we offer to if, uh, if you need help and you can't get um, uh, someone to you and you're living alone. So there's a lot of new innovative resources available that uh, is changing how we can age and our loved and we can help our loved ones as well. Next slide. So for Northwell, our future is to continue to promote longevity, independence, minimize frailty and disability, support and empower caregivers and address serious illness. We are very aligned with the mission of John A. Hartford Foundation. We're very grateful for your partnership. Um, we wanna help patients provide care navigation as they go through this journey. We wanna help translate their healthcare to them so that it's understood. We wanna improve access to models of care and develop new models of care as the population is evolving and healthcare has to evolve with the change in the population. You know, what came out of COVID is the use of telehealth. We need to leverage and, and advocate for the continued use of telehealth. 
And we want to deliver more services in home to keep people out of hospitals um, and aging in place and avoiding hospitalization if that's possible and their wish. And we feel that there's part of all of this movement is advocacy, advocate, 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 whether it be against ageism, it's about uh, public policy. Um, so I wanna thank you. And I just wanna end with Michael Dowling. Uh, I've now encouraged him to now say that, and I hope he will, it's the right care in the right place at the right time. We wanna to continue to provide patient-centered care. Thank you very much. I wanted to just say that I have some colleagues, Dr. Alex Remar from uh, Lenox Hill Hospital is uh, available to answer questions. Uh, Dr. Teresa Amato from our Jerry ED program. She's an emergency room physician who's done geriatric training. And Susan Quietek, who's a nurse by background, has been a health system leader and is a partner on our age-friendly health system initiative. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ronnie, Jane, and Dr. Carney. Um, and just so everyone knows, there's a lot of information in these uh, PowerPoints. They will be shared with everyone. So I posted a lot of links in the chat as well, but uh, we will all those links will be available uh, that were in the PowerPoint for everyone as well. Um, we're going to move now to the Q&A portion of the event. Before we get started, I just want to mention a few things. If you have questions about Medicare plan information, please contact the New York City Department of Aging's Health Insurance Information and Assistance Program, more commonly known as HICAP. Their phone number and website are going to be posted in the chat. HICAP assistance won't tell you which plan you should choose, but they will help you make think through the relevant information so that you can decide which plan makes the most sense given your budget and your healthcare needs. We also know that many of you are finding it challenging to find healthcare providers who accept Medicare. I will list the contact information for geriatric health clinics and departments in the district that accept Medicare. Let me warn you that some clinics have a six month wait list to schedule an appointment, but if you are interested in finding doctors who are trained to work with older adults and who accept Medicare, it may make sense to explore these options sooner rather than later. Um, some of you have asked questions about city unions plans for city worker retirees, either to pay for their original Medicare pro premium or to switch to a Medicare Advantage plan. A link to the most up-to-date information about the status of the plan will also be posted in the chat. Uh, and finally, my senior resource guide has a number has numerous resources in age, on aging in place and other vital services for older adults. You can access the guide online. The link will be in the chat, or you can call my office at 212-490-9535, and we can mail you a copy of the guide. Uh, now we will start with questions that were sent ahead of time. Um, as a reminder, you can continue to submit questions through the Q&A function. I've collected a bunch of those as well, and Facebook. Um, okay, so moving on to questions from the group. And I think this is a good question from the, to start with from the advocacy perspective that uh, some of this discussion has dealt with. I recently contacted a doctor in a private hospital here in New York City. However, I was told that the doctor does not accept patients over the age of 65. I was able to make an appointment with another doctor in that department. What are your thoughts about the situation? I'll leave it to maybe whoever wants to jump in on that one. Sure, I'd be happy to start. Um, I can't speak for that doctor. Uh, <laughs> I will say that, uh, and also we have a slide available that has a list of all of the Northwell New York City doctors that are accepting Medicare. So, and, and a number to link to, uh, so I don't know I don't know if that was posted or not, but we do have that slide available. Um, so many, New York City is a unique environment. Many people do not either accept Medicare or choose not to accept Medicare because um, they, or accept people older. And the incentives are this, 
as we get older, we have more medical problems and it takes longer of a visit. And that is often hard for doctor's offices to manage. And it becomes easier to deal with one problem at a time, shorter visit. Um, and that's not necessarily a problem for the doctor. It's a problem for us as a society and a health system that the, the incentives, the payment models, disincentivize caring for older adults with multiple medical problems. I don't know if anybody else wants to accept or expand on that. Dr. Carney, I might just add, uh, just from personal experience, I'm just maybe on the positive side of that. Maybe it isn't really a Medicare issue. Maybe it's that we know that, um, you know, caring for older people, there are, as you've already mentioned, so many things to consider. And so really, uh, maybe that doctor is, is saying, you know, I'm really not the expert here. Maybe somebody who does care for older patients might be better at this. I'm just saying it, maybe that's a positive thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, any other comments on that one or I'll move on? Okay, so uh, this is a cause for speculation, but I'm sure folks will be will willing to speculate. Will regular go government Medicare remain by run by the government or will it be run by private industry like Medicare Advantage? Uh, I can jump on that for a second and then let others fill in maybe better information. You know, um, there, the Medicare Advantage plans are, are advertising heavily. They're, the membership in those plans is indeed increasing. Um, I don't think any of us can say for sure or would say that um, fee-for-service Medicare is going to absolutely go away. Um, and frankly, I, I personally think it should not. Um, there are some benefits of the managed care plans that are called Ma Medicare Advantage, but there are also some real drawbacks. And um, there are some additional uh, benefits that can be offered through those Medicare Advantage plans. Um, they're often not as deep as they look, and that is a concern for some people who sign up for them. So, you know, um, the numbers are growing because people are interested in that kind of care and getting some of those extras. I think there's a lot of public education to do about uh, when those extra benefits are worth it and when they are more just to attract additional enrollees and actually not as helpful as they look on the surface. Yeah, I, I, the numbers are that the percent of individuals on these Medicare Advantage uh, managed Medicare plans is growing. Um, there's also some recent information to say that maybe the, the benefits of uh, having it is not necessarily there. So I don't necessarily know the direction this is going personally. Um, I, I, the trends are that's continuing to increase. I agree with you, Ronnie. I don't think a full fee Medicare should go away. So this also strikes me as an advocacy point of view. So if some, if one agrees with <laughs> our speakers today, it's important that uh, you know Congress here. And I, I mean, I as someone in the political realm, it is certainly true that efforts to dramatically change Medicare in the past have generally fo faced significant opposition, um, and I would expect that to continue, but it will always be important for people to uh, make sure that their elected officials, in this case, because it's federal, that their Congress members and senators know if they believe that the existing, the preserving, preserving fee-for-service Medicare is critical. Um, and I, and it, I think, yeah, so I'll leave it there. So I ha have a number of home care questions. Um, I think I'll sort of, I'll start with the, a couple. It, is home health help available if you have Medicare and not Medicaid? And then I'll sort of, what does Medicare cover? So let's start with that one because that's a discrete question that has a discrete answer. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, that is the number one question I get from individuals. What does Medicare cover for care at home? Medicare, only covers short-term home care, a nurse visiting after a hospital hospitalization. So maybe for a few, two weeks, nurse visiting. 
the term custodial home care, meaning an aid, a companion, is not covered by Medicare. Medicaid, which is need-based, does provide aids, care at home to try to keep you. But very few people qualify for Medicaid. Um, but if you do, it does provide that service. So it's a difference of Medicare, which only provides a very short window after hospitalization. And then Medicaid is a very need-based um, qualifier to get an aid for personal care, for example, at home. I hope that helps. Okay. And then and generally- If I could add one, one oh, piece to that, it's simply that even if you have Medicaid and you are able to get some of those benefits, it's limited. So even then it, it often doesn't cover everything that one might want or need. That yeah. was great, Maria, thank you. Yes. So, and then I, I had a couple of questions. I was gonna add were... one more thing and I hate yeah, to be sure. a Pollyanna around here, but my <laughs> husband had a serious illness, has a serious illness. And this summer he uh, was, and on Medicare, he received wonderful care from home health care. Uh, you know, they had PT that came every day, a nurse that came. And I mean, it was really wonderful, really helpful. So, um, and that was all covered, uh, you know, hundred percent. So I just want to make that, of course, we have wonderful insurance at our, at our foundation as well that supports that. But I just wanted to put a plug in for home care. But Jane, that was for um, home care nurse coming to the home or, or PT, or rehab, PT for a short course. Yeah, just, you know, for three weeks or four weeks. You're right, it's short, but it, it really made the difference. Yeah. Yeah, and then I these are questions that might just be about if there are specific resources you wanted to point people to, uh, any services available for in-home at old age, uh, and are, are there home care and our group home opportunities for residents in nursing homes suffering from dementia in the community? So I guess to get them out of the nursing home. Yeah, and you know this is where having access to um, the right physician who understands the disease processes and a social worker to help connect you to what you may need. Um, and we are trying to move in that direction. Um, it's so needed in the community. There's also eldercare.gov is a resource that some people can um, put into, uh, you know, look on the website to try to connect to resources. And certainly the, there is a dramatic shortage of uh, home care resources, which is something we uh, run, uh, run into when we're trying to connect people. Uh, and those are broader societal changes that we need to be prioritizing uh, workforce support to build the folks to, to provide the home care. Um, this is a comment that I think is useful and an advocacy point that gets into some of the Medicare stuff. Original Medicare does not cover the, this was when we were talking about COVID tests, does not cover the costs of getting tests at pharmacies. Some Medicare Advantage plans cover costs, but it's an individual plan decision. Um, I'm not sure that that requires a, an answer, but it's, uh, and again, an area of showing some of the ways in which uh, our we obviously want older adults to be getting tested and not providing, uh, not covering it is one of the, an example of something Medicare maybe should be covering. Okay. Well, as you know, the, the Biden administration this week um, agreed to send out at home tests, if we're talking about COVID testing, to those households that requested up to four tests per household, as mentioned at the beginning by, I think it was Senator Kruger at the beginning of this. Right. Um, uh, Roundtable. Um, in addition, a lot of health plans now are indeed also sending those out. So that may speak more to people who have Medicare Advantage. It's I don't know the specifics of, of specific plans, but we at our foundation through our health insurance just got an indication this week that we can have free uh, tests sent to us. So if you have one of those plans, I would look into it because there may be possibilities. Yeah. And if you're on original Medicare, you should fill out the form to get the, the free kits sent directly to you since you're, you may not be able to get them to the pharmacy. Um, okay, uh, somebody asking about how does 
how does this help a senior citizen residing in NYC and how can I easily find access to these resources? Many of the links we put in the chat, including the links we put in toward the end about uh, the various uh, geriatrics programs at, at uh, both at all the, or a number of hospitals around the city um, will give those answers. And we will be sharing those links with all the attendees as well in a follow-up email. Um, what if you prepare what matters, but your physician really does not want to spend time on it as he limits the time he spends with us as patients? Ronnie, can I just jump in and Dr. Carney? Sure. This is what I'm just gonna say, and that's just from the work that we've done around patient priorities care. And the initial work, as you know, this took a long time that was started in 2013. They ended up, the doctors really loved this because the, the, the person coming in, the patients, when we came in, we kind of knew what we wanted. We knew what our issues were and we kind of had the one thing ready to talk about. So it made the visit very effective and very efficient. You know, not a lot of calls later, I forgot to ask this one. It really did help. So it might take some just coaxing and discussions and help to say, you know what, this, uh, this is really important to me and this is how I kind of want our care to go. And um, I can't remember the number, but it was a high percentage of doctors, once they got used to it, they really loved it. It made the care really effective and really efficient. And that's what I'm gonna say just about the work that we're working with in terms of patient priorities care. I see Dr. Amato has her hand up. So yeah, so this is the importance of dashboards and having data and actually seeing um, outcomes. So we have an initiative where we're trying to do the goals of care conversation within the first hour of an emergency room visit. And one of our hospitals that we talked about, Glencoe, which is a level one, they, they are spearheaded this. And what was remarkable about it, when you look at length of stay for that visit, 30 day readmissions, 72 hour returns, all plummeted when the goals of care was the first conversation. Then you compare, you know, you gotta, you gotta compare yourself to the person who's doing really well, looked at my own hospital, Goals of care is being done in the ER, but at hour like 10, which is that's the inpatient team. And how many of those admissions would we have avoided if we'd actually had the goals of care conversation at the very beginning? So just starting to get that, like sort of become part of your practice is like, what actually matters to you right now? What is it that we can do to help you? What do you want? You, you're, you go down a completely different path. And I would argue the visits are actually um, in some ways much more efficient. Um, but you have to sort of put that in your narrative. Every older adult you speak to, that should be the first question that comes out of your mouth, not the last one when you're already 10 hours into the admission. So again, these dashboards are phenomenal. They really help guide your care. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm a big fan of really using data to drive what you're doing and to see that goals of care is a value. It is a value-based um, intervention. And, and I think what Jane and Dr. Amato just said is that we're trying to make this routine to teach our clinicians to listen. And our hope is that as you, as, as, as we are patients, we say what matters and we continue to promote that, um, that, that we'll start hearing. So don't give up. And, and what we did too, and, and leverage your EMR, right? So when you, when we do a goals of care, it now populates every time you open up a provider note, it pops up at the top. So you can actually see the previous conversations. You can actually go back in and readjust it. But that what that person said they wanted now is at the top of your note every time you go into the EMR. So I would say leverage your IT for this as well so that that's just it's just it's just hitting it every single time a provider has a touch base with a patient. So you I think can those tell are your great. doctor to put it in your note. Yeah, I was going to say, I think those are great things for, for healthcare providers and, and systems and for an individual going to the doctor. I am just going to put an exclamation point on, I think it was the last three words of the last slide that Dr. Carney used, which was advocate, advocate, advocate. You know, you do need to talk to your doctor about how important it is to you. And of course, as, as uh, Dr. Amato says, you there's evidence behind that. There's, there's data. Um, but this the need for age-friendly health systems comes from all sides. The health systems need it. So do all of us as patients, as, as individuals. And so ask for it. I will also say that I've had as a physician, I've had patients come in with a letter or a note to say, I just want you to read this when you can. If it can't be at this 15 minutes, 30 minute visit, please read it and you can put it in my chart. Um, and that's another strategy for a individual to, to share what's important. 
Yeah, and certainly we need to acknowledge some doctors are more responsive. <laughs> As all of us have had doctors who were better or worse at uh, listening to their patients, I think, over the years. Um, yeah. Just, I'm going to try to rush through a couple of questions because we're running out of time. There's a lot of questions about the, the services provided at Lenox Hill Northwell. Um, specifically, are most of the things that you talked about available at Lenox Hill? And yeah. if that's a yes or no answer, that would be great in terms of timing. I, and, I will take that and it, it's a resounding yes. Okay, uh, Lenox, and Lenox Hill is champion, championing this very similar to okay. Northwell. And, yes. and your, do your geriatricians at Lenox Hill accept Medicare for seniors? It's hard to find an internist who accepts Medicare in Manhattan. So we gave a, a, I will make sure that that PowerPoint slide that has phone numbers and names of doctors is part of uh, the PowerPoint. I, I, for some reason, I didn't see it there. It might have been a hidden slide. So let's just make sure it's, it's shared with everybody. But we have that, those names and numbers. Okay. And we got a question about other hospitals in the area. We provided some links to other hospitals in the area. We actually did an event earlier with Mount Sinai's palliative care program. Um, and I'm sure we'll be doing. We, we, I just we wanted to, I saw that in the comments. I just want to say, you know, uh, we're very collaborative with the other health systems in this area. Uh, I, you know, I trained at Presbyterian. That's where I did my geriatric fellowship. Um, I still keep in touch with the folks there. We, we take best practices from each other and collaborate quite a bit. So this isn't like a, a Northwell, you know, initiative. This is like a New York state initiative and, and the big health systems have all championed this. So, you know, we're just sharing with you what we've done in our journey, but this is in no way saying that they're not doing phenomenal things as well. So I think we're all in this together. Yeah, we are, we are lucky in, in, on, in the, on the side of Manhattan to have a wealth of, uh, of healthcare resources that a lot of communities would really <laughs> wish they had, um, including programs, geriatric programs in a number of um, places. And I'm going to end the, with my last question because this is something we hear a lot from our constituents. A lot of this discussion relates to contacting family members. We, what if you are alone and want to stay in your own home? So folks who do not feel that they have a support network, um, don't have family that they can rely on, any advice or suggestions for them? No. We recognize this um, in our patients. We see individuals who are aging alone. And um, there are ways to be creative in terms of creating networks through Facebook. Just participating in these type of uh, endeavors is a way to create your own networks. Um, we can learn from other groups. Um, I take care of uh, uh, some nuns in the area. And the convents have this um, networking support system. So there are ways to create networks in the community and, and link to resources and highlight your concerns as a solo ager that, uh, that can help you. And there are some resources out there, yes. Great, well. You know, I, I would add one thing, which is simply that um, we do talk about family caregivers, but um, we don't literally mean only blood relatives, right? We Many of us have networks that are broader than our family. And in this instance, we're really referring to your full network, to others who can step in in, in big or small ways. And um, in addition to that, for long-term services and supports in the New York City area, I added a link into the chat um, that is to the um, New York uh, Office of the Aging that may also be helpful to people. Great. Well, thank you all, Ronnie, Jane, and Dr. Carney. Uh, this has been a great presentation, and we will be sharing all these resources with uh, folks who uh, RSVP to the event. Uh, I want to mention our next roundtable will take place Wednesday, January 26th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., uh, and the topic is an overview of advanced planning documents, including healthcare proxies, power of attorney, and living wells presentators from the from the Duro and the legal New York Legal Assistance Group will give you information about these documents and help you think through who the right person to make healthcare decisions when you are not able to and how you can best plan. Uh, continue to wear your mask in indoor settings and get vaccinated, including your booster shots. Thank you again for joining us this evening or this this morning. <laughs>